is going to be see what a skim short is we've got here yet. Um, we have one, two items on the agenda, uh, but one item for uh, presentation, and it's the affordable housing update. Anna and uh, oh, it's both of you guys. All right, I don't know which one of you guys are starting. Uh, thank you, Council Member Prince. Um, just one moment while I share my screen. Good evening, council members. My name is Hannah Bonmiller. I'm the housing programs manager and with me is my colleague, Mark Santos Johnson, the community development and housing manager. And we're incredibly pleased to be with you here tonight to share the EHHS affordable housing update. The objective of this presentation is to give you an understanding of the needs and the work to address them and to set us up for future discussions about next steps. On the screen is an overview of what we wanna cover. Uh, we will be starting by outlining the needs and then speaking to how we can and are working to address those. By the end, we'll outline next steps in terms of EHHS's work. And of course, we'll leave time for questions and comments. Housing is grounded in a vital need, a really basic need for human shelter. And there's many ways to look at that need through stories, through lived experiences, and through data. Housing professionals rely on housing data to understand housing need and how to create effective solutions. And before I start, I want to caveat that data and the results that come out of it are very dependent on the methodologies and assumptions that go into it. So especially when we're talking about affordability of existing housing stock or future housing need, you may see different numbers in different forums or in other reports, and that's okay. Um, it offers a piece of the complex picture that is housing need. But one number that is very universal to housing discussions is area median income or AMI. And this is a uniform, and this uniform metric is useful because it grounds us in the reality that housing affordability is really driven by household income. The cost of housing itself is not meaningful unless we know the income of the household that is living there or attempting to live there. And that is to say that affordability of housing cost is relative to income. AMI allows us to think of income along a continuum from the lowest income to the highest income. And the center point is the area median. The area we used is based on a King County reference area. And this allows us to account for a wider market since people live and work in different places. And in 2021, the median household income for a household of four in King County was $115,700. This means that 50% of households had incomes lower than this level, and 50% of incomes had incomes higher than this level. But for understanding affordability, we're most interested in looking at that lower 50%. And when we're looking at these households who are making under um, the area median income, we want to hold that we're really talking about a wide variety of families folks with different occupations and different household sizes that impact how far income can go. The chart here grounds us in some of the incomes that we're talking about by household size when we talk about the area median income. It also represents the income bracket terminology often used in housing work that many of you may be familiar with. Zero to 30 meaning extremely low income households folks making 30 to 50% of AMI being very low income, 50 to 80% AMI being low income, and 80 to 100% AMI referred to as moderate income. And those will be used across housing work and in the following slides. I also like to include this slide because it helps us understand what those income figures mean in terms of housing costs. The rents shown here are based on 2021 home program figures and highlight some of the challenges of making these affordable rents a reality. We 
So how do these figures apply to Renton? Um, as part of the housing action plan, we created a way to visualize household need by using this little orange home to re represent 250 households. Using that home, we can visualize how our households are distributed by income and rent in. We see on the screen that 49% of households in Renton make at or above area median income for King County. And of those making less than 100% AMI, 12% make 80 to 100% of the median income, 14 make 50, between 50 and 80% of median income, 12% are very low income, making between 30 and 50% of median, and 12% are extremely low income with incomes making less than 30% of area median income. But we know that all of these households do not have the same type of housing. Um, for instance, some of them are owners and some of them are renters. And we can see of the households in Renton that about 52% own their own homes, while the other 48% are renters. But as you can see on the graphic, there is a greater proportion of higher income households that are homeowners and more renters at lower income levels. And looking at trend data and even in updating this presentation with newly available data, we see that Renton is trending towards having more renters. And this is especially important, especially as we look at affordability, because as we mentioned, um, some households pay more for their housing relative to their income. And when you pay more than 30% of your income on housing costs, you are considered housing cost burden. Data shows that about 35% of all rent in households are experiencing housing cost burden as represented by the yellow homes and households that are renters and those that are making lower incomes tend to be the most cost burdened. According to this CHAS data source, as many as 84% of households earning less than 30% AMI are cost burdened and rented. And among these households, many are severely cost burdened, which means they're spending over half their income on their housing. Nearly three-fourths of Renton's lowest income households are experiencing this extreme cost burden. Overall, these cost burdens are hard to maintain over time, especially severe housing cost burden, and many of the households that face these burdens are under pressure to find different housing options, often outside of Renton, which we see reflected in our trends towards having fewer households in Renton who make below 50% AMI. Household data, like what we were just looking at, really shows the impacts of housing unaffordability. But another way to evaluate the need is to look at the supply and demand factors that are really causing those household level impacts. A slightly reductive way to look at this is to compare the number of households in each income band to the number of existing households that are priced affordably to those households, or excuse me, the number of existing housing units that are priced affordably to those households. Um, this is a little reductive because the reality is that the 4% of the housing stock that is priced affordably to those making at or below 30% AMI we don't actually know what the income of the households that live in those units are. They may or may not be, and are probably not all households that actually make under 30% AMI, even though the unit might be affordable to that income level. But this data is important because it gives us a sense of our supply versus demand in our community. And from this data and the chart um, that visualizes the same thing, we can see the gaps that exist at our lowest affordability levels. Another way to look at supply is by narrowing in on our subsidized housing stock. These are units that we know are limited to and occupied by income or households of a certain income. The data in this chart was collected as part of the sub-regional housing action plan framework. And it shows that of our full supply of housing stock, only 4% or just over 1,500 units are limited to those making a specific income. 
these units are mostly targeted towards folks making 60% um, AMI and less than 10% of subsidized units are targeted towards those making below 50% AMI. So together, this data gives us a high level picture of our housing demand, supply, our affordable supply, and our adopted goals, uh, which you see in the bottom column of our adopted comprehensive. I, I apologize, I believe that's mislabeled. That is our adopted 2012 um, comprehensive plan goals. So a couple of things I want to highlight with this um, data is one is the very evident deficiency of income restricted units um, and subsidized housing stock. These are units that we know are not only priced affordably, but also occupied by people with restricted incomes. It is also important to highlight the clear gap at meeting the needs for extremely low income households, those making at or below 30% AMI. We also know that planning for and meeting the housing goals are going to be more stringent in the future. Um, the bottom column, which I mislabeled as the 2021 CPP goals, um, I was debating whether to use our adopted comprehensive plan goals or the future CPP goals. Um, but the, the main takeaway is that in the future, the countywide planning policy uh, distributions that they're going to be targeting for are going to be higher than what we have already been planning for in the past. So although Renton has made significant progress, we need to do much more to meet the community's growing affordable housing needs. Based on the county growth targets, Renton is expected to accommodate 17,000 more households by 2044, and these units will need to be affordable to a range of incomes. But how much housing we need in each category is one of those methodological dependent processes I mentioned. Um, so you see one methodology here on the screen. And what is shown here uses the projections that were created as part of the housing action plan. It takes that recommended income distribution of new housing units and it applies it to our housing growth target number. So based on this, out of the 17,000 housing units we need to build over the next 20 some years, we would need to build 1,500 units priced affordably to those making at or below 30% AMI. So that's, that's a big need. And I, I think the question that comes up in response is how are we going to meet these needs? And the reality is that local governments only play one piece of the housing puzzle. And we have to work in conjunction with our developers, funders, and other levels of governments to, to ensure that these needs get met. So what can we do? Um, to address the need, it's very important to think about the spectrum of housing response. And this can be understood as a continuum from short-term homelessness response to longer-term homelessness prevention. And along that continuum, there are very important building blocks, um, emergency shelter, permanent supportive shelter, transitional housing, and affordable rental and home ownership. All of these building blocks are important to ensure, to ensure thriving families and equitable outcomes in our community. And as local governments, we cannot so solve the housing crisis, but we do play an important policy and regulatory role. At higher affordability levels, um, units priced affordably to those making above 50% AMI, we are able to and do use zoning flexibility and incentives to support the development of affordable housing. But as seen on the graphic, the investment and work needed to bring on units increases as we get to deeper levels of affordability. And at the lowest level, significant government support is needed in addition to the support of zoning and incentives to produce those units. Ultimately, understanding that greater government intervention is going to be required at lower, lower levels of affordability helps us prioritize and leverage our resources for those with the greatest need. 
As part of our efforts to prioritize and plan for housing needs, the city developed a housing action plan funded by the, a grant from the Department of Commerce. This plan was guided by an advisory committee, targeted public engagement and staff input over the course of an 18, 18 month process. And the plan was adopted in fall of 2021. The Housing Action Plan is action oriented and focuses on near term solutions to increase housing availability and affordability. It included two components, a sub-regional framework and a rent and specific housing action plan. And the rent and specific housing action plan looked both at our current and future needs and then recommended new strategies to implement to increase the supply of housing. Findings and themes were identified as part of the plan's assessment of housing needs. I'm not gonna walk through each of these and if you want time, you can uh, find the full document online. But I do wanna emphasize some of the reoccurring themes that we saw in the previous data. That one, more renters and homeowners are not able to find the types of housing that are right for them and are therefore cost burdened. And two, that Renton needs more subsidized housing for the lowest income households that are not served by the private market. <clears throat> the HAP provides six recommendations to better meet housing needs. These recommendations represent a broad set of actions that the city can pursue during the five-year plan implementation horizon. They also consider some longer term actions and recommendations. And all of these, although all of these actions are important, I wanna take out a moment to call out strategy two, promoting diverse housing types and sizes in neighborhoods. Because providing for a wider range of housing needs in Renton into the future will require different types and formats of housing. Providing for additional housing types and sizes at appropriate densities and in appropriate locations can help encourage smaller units and increase our housing supply. Another important action that we have upcoming is the required update to the comprehensive plan. The update is an opportunity to reflect on and establish long-term goals and long-term goals to meet our identified housing needs and to ensure that values like reducing displacement and racial equity in housing are clearly stated. The last component of the housing action plan I want to reference is the implementation strategies. And these are six topic areas that require more coordination and analysis to support future actions. Four of these uh, have work ongoing at different stages, including the residential land use analysis, the affordable housing funding strategy, TOD land banking strategy, and ongoing monitoring and review. This implementation work reinforces the goal of the housing action plan, which is to increase housing availability and affordability but as I mentioned before, building units does not happen alone. And to learn more about our work to create and maintain partnerships, I will pass it over to Mark Santos Johnson. Oh, Mark, we can't hear you. Good evening. Thank you, Hannah. Hannah did a wonderful job presenting information about Renton's housing needs and Renton's housing action plan. I would now like to share some information with you regarding affordable housing development with our partners in our community, followed by funding and beyond. Mm -hmm. Since the city doesn't actually build any housing, all of the affordable housing development in Renton is built by public housing authorities and nonprofit or for-profit developers. Consequently, partnerships with other entities are essential to provide more affordable housing for current and future Renton residents. The 80-year-old Renton Housing Authority is the city's oldest and most significant affordable housing partner. RHI is also a primary partner with the city for the Sunset Area Community Revitalization and the Sunset Area Transformation Plan. RHA is the largest subsidized housing provider in Renton with 864 affordable housing units and 18 projects. They also administer 647 housing choice, veterans and emergency housing vouchers, plus 470 eight port-in vouchers that were issued by another public housing authority for residents renting an apartment or house in Renton. RHA has built four new housing projects in the Sunset area in the last 15 years with a total of 136 units. Over the last five years, they also modernized nine of their older buildings with a total of 643 units. 
RHA's most recent project is the Sunset Oaks Apartments, completed in 2021. This 60-unit workforce housing project is RHA's fourth replacement housing project for the former Sunset Terrace Public Housing Project and the first residential project to be completed adjacent to the Sunset Neighborhood Park. A highly anticipated project is the redevelopment of the Renton Housing Authority's headquarters building in the Sunset area, one block from the Renton Highlands Library. RHA plans to start construction later this spring and complete the project in fall 2023. The new mixed use building will include 76 units to serve veterans, elderly persons, and persons with disabilities affordable at either 30 or 50% of AMI. RHA recently relocated their offices for the duration of the construction, but the new building will have both new RHA office space and service areas on the first floor with three floors of residential um, housing above. The project will be RHA's fifth and final replacement housing project for the former Sunset Terrace Public Housing Project. <clears throat> Helping to create affordable home ownership opportunities has become increasingly important to the city, especially as home prices in the region continue to soar. <clears throat> the city started working with Homestead Community Land Trust in 2016 as part of the Sunset Area Transformation Plan to increase affordable home ownership in the community. Homestead is a Seattle-based nonprofit community land trust organization committed to increasing access to permanently affordable home ownership in the region as a means to create thriving, equitable, and inclusive communities. Homestead's first project in Renton was the Willowcrest Townhomes. The 12-unit project was completed last year in the Sunset area on land donated by the Renton Housing Authority. The three and four bedroom unit project is the first net zero energy multifamily affordable home ownership project in the region. All homes were priced at or below $315,000 to households at or below 80% of AMI. Using the community land trust model, all units will be maintained as affordable home ownership in perpetuity. Homestead is currently working on the design and fundraising for a 19 unit Willowcrest Townhomes Phase Two project on land adjacent to the first project to be donated by RHA. Homestead is also the steward for seven three-bedroom affordable home ownership units at the 60-unit Earlington Village project on the western edge of Renton city limits. The residential development was approved with a density bonus that included seven affordable units in exchange for increased density. Homestead managed the initial sale of the first income qualified buyers and will provide compliance management and stewardship support to homeowners throughout the 50 year compliance period. Since the affordable housing crisis is a regional problem that disproportionately impacts South King County, it's essential to work with others in South King County to address the problem. Consequently, the South King Housing and Homelessness Partners, SKIP, is a critical partner for the city. Established in 2019, SKIP includes 10 South King County cities plus King County. SKIP's mission is to work together and share resources to increase available options for South King County residents to assess, to assess affordable housing and preserve existing affordable housing stock. SKIP plans to award funds this year to support affordable housing development from the newly created SKIP Capital Fund using SHB funds pooled from the city of Renton and other SKIP member cities. Council President McGurvin is the city's representative on the SKIP Executive Board, which meets monthly. On this slide, you can see all the completed rental projects in Renton in the past 15 years that included affordable units. These 10 projects include 657 affordable units in the city. The list, the list includes projects developed by for-profit and nonprofit entities and public housing authorities but 80% of the projects were developed by a public housing authority or nonprofit entity. The projects range in size from eight to 217 units with an average of 66 units per project. On this, uh, on this slide, you can see three projects in Renton completed in the last 10 years that contained affordable home ownership units. These projects include a total of 54 homes priced as permanently affordable home ownership. Two projects were developed by nonprofit entities, and one project was developed by a for-profit using the city's affordable housing density bonus incentive. 
There are three projects that contain affordable housing units currently under development in the city with a total of 498 affordable housing units. The two largest projects are being developed by for-profit developers and the third project is RHA's Sunset Gardens project. Finally, we have two pipeline or proposed projects that contain affordable housing units with a total of 27 units. This includes one mixed income rental housing project developed by a for-profit and Homestead's proposed Willowcrest Townhome Space II affordable homeownership project. We are very thankful for all the affordable housing units that our partners have built and or are currently working on. However, as Hannah noted, we need to do much more to meet the community's growing affordable housing needs. Affordable housing developers rely on a variety of local, state, and federal funding sources to build their projects. Unfortunately, each source is limited, and generally the requests far surpass the available funding. The federal low-income housing tax credits are the largest funding source for many affordable rental housing projects, but affordable homeownership projects are not eligible. Typically, projects need to piece together multiple funding sources to meet their project funding needs. King County's funding is essential for most Renton projects. For example, every project completed in Renton by a public housing authority or a nonprofit developer in the last 15 years included King County funding. Local city funding is also very important to help projects leverage other funds. As noted on this slide, the city has three primary sources of funds for affordable housing development. The City Council created the Housing Opportunity Fund in 2008 and allocated $200,000 in general funds for the fund. Proceeds supported two affordable rental housing and two affordable homeownership projects. However, the Housing Opportunity Fund is currently depleted. The City Council authorized HB 1590 in 2020 and allocated $1.5 million last year to RHA's Sunset Gardens project. These funds may be used for housing or housing related services and are limited to eligible target populations at or below 60% of AMI. Annual collections are based on actual sales tax revenue but are estimated at approximately 3 million per year. Finally, the city council authorized the pulling of SHB 1406 funding to the SKIP capital fund through 2022. Annual, collects, annual collections again are based on actual sales tax revenue but are not to exceed 236,000 per year for 20 years. The funds can be used to support affordable housing projects at or below 60% of AMI. The Housing Opportunity Fund can be used to support a variety of housing needs, including both affordable rental and affordable homeownership projects. Unfortunately, the 60% AMI limitation and or the eligible target populations for the other two sources make them difficult to use for, for affordable homeownership projects which are typically targeted for households at or below, at or below 80% of AMI. In order to meet Renton's affordable housing needs, it's essential that we continue to advocate for additional county, state, and federal funding, as well as more philanthropic and corporate support to fund more affordable housing projects in our community. It's also important for us to provide funding for proposed Renton projects to help them leverage other funding resources and to continue to advocate with our partners for funding to support their projects. By working together, we can better meet Renton's current and future affordable housing needs. Anna? Thanks, Mark. So we covered a lot of data, information, and ongoing work. Um, but the thing we really want to leave you with is our next steps, so we can hear from you what's missing and what other things we should be focusing on. So first, in terms of next steps, as we heard from Mark, it is incredibly important for us to continue to fund our affordable housing developers and to use our dollars to leverage to build more units. We can ensure this in a few ways. First, by identifying a pipeline of projects for HB 1590. This source will continue to accumulate, giving us new opportunities to support eligible housing projects. We can also put dollars into the Housing Opportunity Fund. This fund allows the flexibility needed for affordable homeownership projects in our community. And we can also continue to pool our SHB 1406 dollars to skip to support the sub-regional capital fund. 
Next, we need to implement the Housing Action Plan. The city recently received a $100,000 grant for Housing Action Plan implementation, which is funding work on three projects. First, a residential land use study to refine missing middle policy options. Second, a sub-regional effort to develop an affordable housing monitoring program. And third, a study to explore linkage fees as an additional revenue source beyond uh, for affordable housing. Beyond this, uh, there is an existing, um, with, there exists within the HAP a large work program that outlines um, ongoing implementation, monitoring, and review work. We will also need to advocate for more county, state, and federal resources for more dollars that work for affordable home ownership and for more involvement from our corporate and philanthropic partners. And lastly, we will continue, we need to continue to do the things that we do well, to partner with our affordable housing developers, to collaborate internally to promote affordable housing and to advance new policy initiatives as they come in a way that fits our community. So this is normally the point where I would stop um, and ask for questions, but before that, I do want to take a special moment, if I'm able, to recognize an individual without whom this work um, that was showcased tonight would not be possible. And that is Mark Santos Johnson. Mark has tirelessly been working and advocating for affordable housing and community development in the city for the last 22 years. His work has directly resulted in more affordable housing in Renton and his commitment to service has inspired many more positive impacts by others. One of his many accomplishments, but one very close to me, uh, Mark established the AmeriCorps VISTA program at the city which has gone on to recruit and train over 20 national service volunteers. Personally, Mark's mentorship and encouragement have been instrumental to me and his passion for service and others inspires me to be bold in my work. Mark recently announced his well-deserved retirement and before he goes, I just wanna say a big thank you. So thank you, Mark. And that uh, council does conclude our presentation and we'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, also, yes, thank you to Mark. I, I appreciate the, the end of that presentation, even though it wasn't in our slide deck. Uh, uh, I'm sure- Nor, we'll nor in mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look a little surprised. Uh, so, and I understand we might have you back for another time. So I won't finish it. Since we have limited time before we need to uh, recess uh, for executive session, I will jump right into questions. First hand, I saw Ray, was Governor Albertson, and then I saw, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Hannah, this, this has to do with um, the uh, page 19, the housing needs assessment, the written will need 9,300 housing units by 2040. And then, but earlier uh, on page 11, no, no, page 14, it had, it had basically breaking down 0 to 30, 30 to 50. That adds up to more than 9,300. I think that's part of this King County's growth target for, for rent. It says 17,000 housing units by whatever. And granted, the 7,100 is over the 80% AMI. So really those under 80%, those numbers seem to be different. The 4,100 or so uh, under 80% and then, but 9,300, 9, you're just talking total Total number, the numbers don't seem to totally jive is kind of the first part of my question, I guess. Yes, I can, I can, I can speak to that. Um, let me, and correct me if I'm not looking at the right numbers. Um, but so there, there are really two um, processes that happened. As part of the housing action plan, we did a, um, a projection of future housing need. And this quantified both our existing underproduction and projected future need. And the estimated um, number of housing units that we would need to build to be, uh, meet that future need was 9,300. So that was um, created as part of the housing action plan um, and as part of the pro projection methodology. 
Um, the 17,000 units are um, housing units that were allocated to the city of Brenton as part of the King County um, um, growth target process. So that is, that is based on a political division of expected growth throughout the region. Um, and so that is not a projection methodology. It, it is more of a political process. So on, on slide 14, what you are seeing is I, I merged the, the two um, as an attempt to showcase future needs. So I took the 17,000 number, which is what we do need to plan for and um, we'll, we'll be working towards. And then I took the um, income breakdowns that were developed as part of the housing action plan. So they, they are two different methodologies and they are not perfectly in alignment, but I wanted to use it as an illustration of what, what we might need to be looking for in the future. So then may I add pins to that? If that was a follow-up yeah, yeah, it's, it's a follow-up on that. Yeah, one. yeah, it's, it's a follow-up follow on that. So mm -hmm. I was doing some quick math with, with all these numbers and then looking at uh, uh, slide 30 with the uh, affordable well, those are affordable rentals. I see 2007, 2021. But I mean, the number, even when I look at the uh, the affordable uh, uh, projects that have been done, you know, you do the, the numbers and it just doesn't seem as though we're even close in line with the pace that's going to be needed to hit these numbers. I mean, by one, if it's the 4,100, it's like 227 a year for 18 years, I'm going to 2040. You do, do the uh, 18 years over 9,300, it's 516 units, you know, and per year, and I look at some of these numbers, it's like, okay, well, this had 60 units, and this had, so I don't know, I'm, like I said, my math may be off, but this looks like a serious ramp up somehow, some way, the numbers just don't seem to align to me as far as, is it possible, it, it, I guess is my question. <laughs> Well, I, I think is it possible is, is a question of political will that goes beyond the people in this room. Um, it, it is a, a larger effort that will need more resources than we're able to put in. Um, generally, in terms of uh, development in Renton, we, we actually do have strong development patterns. We are able to generally keep track on the number of units that we need to produce. The real challenge is, is ensuring that the units are affordable to a wide variety of incomes. So can we meet our development goals? Yes. Can we meet our affordability goals? We, we need to develop some and be intentional about the strategies that will get us there. Thank you. I totally agree it's possible. It's the political will. I uh, really appreciate that question. Council yeah. Rell. Okay. Councilmember Howard and then Councilmember Press. Keep it the same thing. So I'm, um, my question is on the King County AMI. And uh, starting at, on page seven of the slides, we're talking about the number of household, Renton households that fall into these different AMI categories. How confident are we that the King County AMI number is representative of what's actually happening in Renton to make the comparison for these percentages of our households to a King County AMI? It seems almost like, it, I don't know, but to me, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to reconcile our number of households to an AMI that includes the entire county. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a, a long kind of methodology, methodological answer behind this, um, but the, you know, kind of the short of it is that area median income and the median um, income information that we would pull for the city of Renton is really like comparing apples and oranges. Um, the methodology that HUD uses to develop area median income um, con considers a number of factors that is not such as household size that is not reflected when we pull data that is specific to the city of Renton. So I, we could definitely pull the uh, median income for the city of Renton and look at it compared to the AMI, um, but they're two different numbers and they have different assumptions that go into them. So I think what's important for us in using AMI is understanding that it's a relative measure. It is showing us, it is based on a number that is the whole county, but it is showing us what is happening in Renton relative to that number. 
So we still get to see the rent in picture. It's just relative to something that is established on a wider market. Um, the question that you raised, council member, it has been brought up a lot in South King County. There is a lot of concern about that, um, the area median being very different from the market that we see within our own communities. Um, but within the housing work, we found that this is the most reliable measure for us to understand our communities and to be able to look at it in a broader sense. Thank you. All right, we got about five-ish, maybe four minutes left. Uh, Council Member Perez. Oh, no, we can't hear you. You're muted. Thank you, everyone. Highly appreciate it. So, uh, Mark, really quick, then, and Hannah, very much for your presentation. As always, you shine. Uh, you, you're very knowledgeable all the time uh, providing this information to us. I will never remember the day that you and I, we were at the Sunset neighborhood presenting to uh, the team of Senator Kale uh, to bring so many need federal funds and your passion and commitment. I will uh, never forget the lesson that I learned from you that day what we are doing and why we are doing it. Uh, so very important to remind uh, that when we have these presentations, I appreciate that you guys bring the need as well as what we have done, but also regionally among the 39 cities and towns, we have become one of the leaders of affordable housing because of you, Mark, because of your commitment and because of how much you have keep reminding us uh, how important it is to bring in the region of affordable housing. So Renton is one of the leading cities uh, in this area. And it's thanks to you, Mark. And, uh, and, and I just wanted to, to remind everybody that, yes, we need much more to do, but we have done amazingly well uh, compared with other cities. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you. And um, thank you to the council members and Hannah for your comments. Um, uh, I will have an opportunity to um, talk with you next week regarding um, a Sunset area update and um, can make some additional comments at that time. But um, uh, it truly has been an honor to work here and um, all of the work we've accomplished has been done through partnerships and um, just appreciate the support of the uh, city leadership, council staff and our partners who together have done some pretty amazing things. Lots, lots more work to do, but I think we have a good foundation to work on. So, thank you. I think I'm going to give away, I think will be the last question or comment to Councilor Rivera, and then we'll probably need a break. Yes, it is a question. Um, so, my question for staff is, and I know this was mentioned during the retreat, if, is, are we able to even stay on track to develop affordable housing if we do not set up an annual allocation commitment for the Housing Opportunity Fund? Can I respond to that? Do I need to show sure, me? as long as you're in range of the mic, yeah. Oh, actually, I was hoping that, um, okay. yes, I would, I would love an answer from anyone. Um, I, I think that the short answer is we, we need more resources to stay on track. So if we're going to develop affordable housing, we need to set up an annual allocation commitment to the Housing Opportunity Fund, especially for this biannual budget is what I'm hearing. That is the, other, recommendation. the other aspect of that is in order to support affordable home ownership, we need more flexibility than what we have in our other two funds. So we need more funding in general, but we also could benefit from housing, having a housing opportunity fund that could support affordable home ownership, which we know there's a lot of need and interest to do. And unfortunately, about 99% of the public funds that are available for affordable housing um, go into rental housing. So it's it's really important um, to have that flexibility for affordable home ownership as well. Thank you. I just wanted to make that note since into the budget here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, good questions all around. Great answers, great presentation. Um, love the, all the data from y'all as always. Um, obviously a lot more work to do with this and I highly doubt this will be the last time we talk affordable housing this year. Um, and certainly <laughs> as we go into budget, I hope you do hope that's part of the discussion as well. So. Thank you all. We are going to go ahead and adjourn our free to the whole, but we're going to recess into executive session to discuss the central litigation pursuant to RCW 423110 1I for approximately 30 minutes. The no official action will be taken and we'll return to our council meeting at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank May you. The adjourned. Thank you.